An insights on PBS Hawaii triple header. State Senator Roz Baker is being challenged by Therese Amato in the Democratic primary for the seat representing West and South Maui. State representatives Ken Ito and Jarrett Keohokalole face off in a winner-take-all Democratic primary in Senate District 24, Kaneohe and Kailua. And all three candidates in the GOP primary for governor, Andrea Tupola, John Carroll, and Ray LaRue. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. Tonight we'll be hearing from the candidates running for three different offices. The first half hour will feature the two Democratic candidates running for State Senate District 6, which is South and West Maui incumbent Roz Baker and challenger Therese Amato. After a quick change, we'll move to Oahu State mm -hmm. Senate District 24, which includes parts of Kaneohe and Kailua and the Marine Base. This will be a winner-take-all Democratic primary between the current State House House Representatives Ken Ito and Jarrett Keoho Kalole. After a quick change, Daryl Huff will take over as moderator and spend a full hour hearing from three candidates in the Republican primary for governor, John Carroll, Ray LaRue, and Andrea Tupola. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. As usual, we want to acknowledge our volunteers who will be taking your questions tonight. There you see a live shot of them eagerly awaiting your input in our show. Now to our guests, the two Democrats facing off in the primary election for Senate District 6, which covers the area from McKenna in South Maui to Kapalua in West Maui. The winner will face Green Party candidate Melissa Shishido in November. Our first guest is challenger Therese Amato. She grew up in South and Central Maui and graduated from St. Anthony Junior Senior High School. She's a a single mother of four and a small business owner. Running for re-election is Senator Roz Baker. She has represented Maui for 26 years in the State House and Senate. She moved to Hawaii in 1980 after being a lobbyist for the National Education Association in Washington. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. We want to start with an issue that affects so many of the islands but definitely is being felt on Maui in particular. South and West Maui have felt a large Large influx of tourists and are feeling the crunch of all of the impacts of those tourists. This weighed heavily on Maui residents that we heard from recently in our quality of life show. Let's take a quick listen. Basically, the beaches that I go to, like I, I can't go to anymore just because of the overcrowding. And so I've always had to adjust and adjust to that population that's always visiting the tourism population. Because I like seclusion. I like to be um, out in the in the wilderness and and beautiful scenic areas and not necessarily have to see a lot of people just personally. As the challenger, we'll start with you. Do we have too much ch uh, reliance on tourism? I think that we do have quite a bit of an over-reliance on tourism. However, that said, we must maintain and protect the tourism that we currently have while re-evaluating how much more we're trying to attract to our island. Because yes, our infrastructure is severely overtaxed at this point. Uh, Senator Baker, when you hear, uh, you know, a resident saying they can't go to their favorite beach anymore and, you know, a lot of people say I can't go to my favorite hike or brunch place, what have you. What's your response to that? How do we change this matrix so that we're not so reliant on tourism that it, you know, impacts residents in that way? Well, I think all of us really want to figure out how we can diversify our economy, whether it's looking at some small farming, whether it's looking at uh, growing technology. I mean, they, those are the things that would give some of our residents different options. You know, the other thing that's important is to try to grow our health care sector. One of the things the legislature passed was a bill that I had introduced to provide a preceptor tax credit. So if you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be a nurse, you have to have somebody to precept you, to monitor you, to work with you while you're doing your clinicals. If we don't have that and we're it's hard to get them because they're all volunteers, then we're not going to be able to grow our own doctors and nurses and other health professionals. So I think if we focus on technology, we focus on health care, we have an opportunity to have more of our people working in industries that are higher paying and not just in the visitor industry. 
You know, on uh, the issue of being overcrowded, you know, another sort of subset of that is the issue of housing. Yes. And we heard that in our quality of life show across all of the islands. A lot of the hotel workers even say that they can't afford to live in the places uh, that they that they need to work, and so they're driving great distances, living with relatives. The rents being so high, the wages low for service-related jobs. How do we balance that equation? I know Maui has had a tough housing crunch. We have, and. You know, fortunately, we've put some money into the budget that will provide us with 200 new infill apartments at the villages of Leali'i. We've also looked at uh, funding some, I think it was uh, a million four to develop some house lots for DHHL. But we need to have more partnerships with uh, our community developers who want to come in and do affordable housing, not the high-end housing, but really res housing that residents can have because we need to have housing, workforce housing for doctors and nurses and teachers and other folks that are maybe just starting out their careers and have not the resources to pay for some of the high rents that we have. So I think we have that opportunity. The legislature has been chipping away at it, but obviously we need to do more. What are you hearing about the state of housing? on that? So housing is definitely in a critical point right now. And I think one way that we can start to bring in more housing is by making giant corporations pay their fair share. You know, you look at the $1.1 billion hotel sale of the Grand Wailea recently, yet they're only assessed and taxed at less than a third of that rate. That's just wrong, you know? That's money that could be con contributing to our infrastructure and our housing needs for our people. How would you propose the legislature actually enforce something like that? Well, I think that we really need the state to be working with the counties more intimately to make sure that these giant, giant hotels and corporations start paying their fair share and are assessed at the, at the correct use rate. Senator Baker, you brought up the issue of health care, mm -hmm. um, talking about doctors and nurses and providing the kind of support that those folks need. Uh, on Maui in particular, is the state doing enough to protect the health care needs of the residents? Well, I think we made an uh, important step by taking Maui Memorial uh, Medical Center, our hospital, outside of Hawaii Health Systems Corporation, outside of the state, because it brought in additional resources. It really helped to make sure that we had opportunities for people to get well on Maui. I know that in West Maui, there's a proposal for a small community hospital so that people don't have to go to the other side. We've had um, upgrades up in Kula so that we have more long-term care facilities there. Part of the development in West Maui is for additional long-term care beds and Halimakua, which is one of our um, absolutely excellent nursing facilities, is looking at an expansion. So health care is an, an issue and uh, an industry that I think we really can devote many more resources and a lot more attention because it's going to help the residents that are there. Yes, yeah, so we absolutely must do more for health care. The Maui News recently reported that our hospital is, is at dangerously critical low levels of staffing for their nurses throughout all departments. It's dangerous right now. And I've had nurses and doctors all approach me and say, you know, we've got to make some changes there. And so it's a great honor to have the Hawaii Medical Association endorse me and trust me to, to do what's right for the medical for, for Maui County because right now lives are at stake. What more can the state be doing? I mean, what would you suggest that, that hasn't been done? Well, I think that, you know, the privatization has already happened, unfortunately, but we should have been looking at that a little bit closer. Was the right thing to do to sell Maui's hospital? I'm not so sure, but now that we are, we've got to make sure that they are adequately funded and we bring in the doctors and the resources that we need there because I had a stroke about 600 days ago and Today, there's still no neurosurgeon on staff. If someone has a stroke there, the hope is that they can be stabilized to be brought over to Oahu. And if they can't, chances are they'll die. You know, we're uh, moving to another topic now. We have have legalized uh, medical marijuana in the state of Hawaii. What's your take on recreational marijuana use? Should marijuana be legalized across the board in our state? I'm still a little Kanalua on recreational. I think medical marijuana is very important and we know that people can use it to address a lot of concerns. They don't get addicted because medical marijuana doesn't have a really high percentage of THC. 
in places that have recre uh, recreationalized it, they've had some unintended consequences. So I think if we're going to go in that direction, it needs to be studied very well and put in an appropriate context. Because I've had people who work in some of the trades say, we really don't want people high working in electricity or in some other high risk uh, occupations because it's not, not safe. And what's your take? Should the state legalize marijuana? I absolutely think it's high time we legalize recreational marijuana. And I think that we should tax only the visitors who purchase it here. What about some of the issues that Senator Baker, you know, uh, brought up? The idea that some of this could be dangerous if it's not, you know, appropriately monitored? You know, I think if you look at places like Colorado and Seattle where they have it legalized, they haven't had nearly as many problems as people were saying, oh no, you're going to have people driving stoned on the roadways and there's going to be all kinds of car accidents. That simply has not happened. Let's talk about climate change. Uh, you know, all of our islands are definitely under threat from this. Do you feel like the state is prepared for climate change? I think we're moving in the right direction, but we're not there yet. I think we have to do more to protect our, we need to start working on managed retreat approaches rather than building seawalls. On Maui, we've seen a lot of coastal erosion. Yes, we have. Uh, what do you think about the, the efforts that are being taken to deal with climate change? Well, the legislature took a great step by adopting uh, the uh, climate change uh, goals from uh, the United Nations. And so we've seen in Maui County, they're starting to build that in when they are looking at where they're going to be allowing development. And But the state still needs to move inland so many sections of Hanoa, Hanoa Pi'ilani Highway that um, actually allow uh, Lahaina to be uh, traverse to the other side of the island. And if we don't do some of that, we are going to see more of our roadway go into the ocean. So it's really important that DOT be more proactive. They don't have to do the long stretches, but they're going to have to do some areas that would bring it back uh, way off the shoreline. And I think it's something that all of us need to be thinking about, working toward, because we don't want to harden our coastline. But we do have to figure out ways that we can renourish our beaches and make some of the building that was there maybe well before we had setbacks uh, still livable and usable. There are two issues that are going to be coming up for voters, and we'd like to get your takes on that. Um, first is the Constitutional Convention. Do you think there should be a Constitutional Convention? Why or why not? I don't see that a case has been made for the need for a constitutional convention. It's expensive. And voters and residents have great access to their legislators and our processes are open and above board. So no one has made the case that I've heard of needing a constitutional convention, that there's some big process that hasn't been addressed by the normal course of the legislative sessions. What's I absolutely case? think that this is a question for the voters to decide, but if we were to have a constitutional convention, we would have to make sure there are special protections in place to ensure that giant corporations aren't allowed to funnel a bunch of money into the elections and then enact some very regressive policies. So I think it can be done if that's what the community wants, because really it's about the community and what they want. However, I think we need to do it very carefully. Another initiative that is before the voters uh, this time around is the issue of giving the state power to tax investment properties to raise money for education. What's your take on that? Is that something you support? Absolutely. I think that we should be taxing all of our offshore investors to use that money to pay for our critical infrastructure needs. Um, there's been some criticism of this bill because you know, the, the way it's worded to say that it's a little bit too broad. What's your take? Well, that's, the devil is always in the details. And if the voters pass the constitutional amendment, then it's going to be up to the legislature to determine what is an investment property and how the details of how that law or that uh, constitutional amendment would be implemented. I know some of the counties are concerned because real property is really their only steady source of revenue for county functions. So I think it's something that voters need to take very seriously, have some discussions, and really think about it because if it does pass, it comes back to the legislature. And I think that's the appropriate thing to do is have the voters take a look and make that determination. And then uh, the legislature would have bills introduced, there would be discussion and hearings, and all of that vetting would come at that particular point in time. 
We want to bring in the audience. Of course, that's what makes this show a little different. And so we can encourage you to keep calling those volunteers that we showed you at the top of the broadcast. Uh, we have Roger here writing in, asking about nature. Will you work to keep the natural beauty of Hawaii for the next 100 years so we have islands that locals can be proud to leave, live in or keep and keep our tourism alive with natural beauty. You know, a lot of people, the buzzword these days is sustainability. Mm -hmm. Are we doing enough to protect our environment? I don't know that there's ever enough that we can do to protect our environment. I think it's something that has to be the task of every citizen here. Because if we lose that specialness that is Hawaii, then we're not going to have the kind of place that people either want to come visit or that our young people want to come back to and work and live. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to do everything we can to make sure that our environment is protected. Is there something specific that you can point to that on Maui has been done or you think needs to be done that you would support? Well, one of the things the legislature passed was to make sure that we don't have harmful sunscreen chemicals uh, in our coastal waters. And so that was one thing that helps. On Maui, we have erosion issues, and I think we have to look at how we can work with both the owners of properties as well as the county and the state to renourish, to bring the sand back, because you can find it, you know, offshore. It just needs to be brought back where it, the, the natural waves and, and the winter storms took it off the, off the coast. So I think we've got to do some of that, but I think we also have to look at how we can get engaged young people, seniors, visitors, to understand how important our natural resources are and not to do the things that are going to destroy them and permanently damage them. What would, what would your answer be to Roger? Are we doing enough to protect our natural resources, particularly on Maui? I don't think we are. I'm honored to be endorsed by the Sierra Club. And I just have to say, you know, for the price of a 5,000 rent-a-car parking garage at our airport, we could have provided every man, woman, and child on Maui with a Tesla battery to stabilize their grid and start looking at more renewables like solar energy. What would you have the legislature do? I would have the legislature start looking at how we're allocating our, our hotel tax, start returning that to the county. The counties know how best to spend the money. It's generated there, it needs to go back to the counties, and it's time for the TAT, the hotel tax, to go back to the counties. You know, we touched on this at the beginning, but uh, we have a question tonight just asking broadly on the economy. What will you do to promote a viable economy? Well, I think we need to look at our schools and our teachers. Our teachers need to be paid better. At our, you know, they're entrusted with our children. I'm a mom of four kids who all went to Maui public schools, and yet they have all had to move to the, to the United States to find decent jobs and to afford a place to live and to receive quality health care. So we need to look at our education. We need to start paying our teachers what they need. We need to make sure that they have the supplies that they need in their classrooms so that they're not paying for these supplies out of their pockets. Once we can provide our children with a better education, then the opportunities begin to to produce themselves, there's innovation that, that stems from education. So once we start educating our children and providing them with the opportunities to be creative and to explore, new industry will come to Maui. What's your take on that? What can we do to uh, promote the economy, promote a viable economy? Well, I think one of the things we can do is to help our young people become the entrepreneurs that many of them are interested in doing. We can look at promoting more of the tech skills and computer skills and the kinds of uh, innovations that are coming and, and coming from some new businesses, from some of our entrepreneurs. So if we incent that and really stimulate it in our young people, then I think they're going to be providing those new jobs and they're going to be providing the new technologies and they're going to be able to stay here in Hawaii and thrive. But we have to invest in those kinds of activities, whether it's in collaboration with our economic development boards on each of our islands, working with the teachers, working with some companies that need these kinds of em, uh, employees so that we enrich what is happening not just at the high school but at the community college level and making sure that our young people have access to 
the, the right tools, the right education, and the right learning environment so that they can develop what I think many of them have within them, particularly the ones that are growing up in this generation uh, and will actually be the new employers, the new job creators, and the new entrepreneurs that will make Hawaii a vibrant, uh, continue to make it a vibrant place. Uh, this show, of course, we allow the viewers to ask questions, and we also invite the candidates to ask questions as well. So uh, we'd like you to ask a question to your opponent and, and you to do the same. Um, so please, as the challenger, we'll let you go first. Actually, I would love to allow my opponent to go first. Okay. <laughs> Senator <laughs> I Baker. I guess go first last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just uh, ask my opponent what would be her... Uh, three or four point economic plan for uh, moving Hawaii forward? Three or four point plan. So ideally we invest more in our education system starting with our teachers making sure that they're well paid. We help expand UHMC to offer more programs and help them build the partnerships so they can collaborate with universities across the country and then provide them with the tools that they need to create new exploratory innovations, you know, maybe looking more at, at robotics or, you know, the, uh, the shocking POTUS that we have. <laughs> he wants to do his space force or whatever that is. But here we can, we can create things, you know, we can look at satellites, we can look at other technologies that require a little more innovation than we've explored in the past. And that would be my my goal for sure. Okay, and, and we invite you if you have one to ask a question to Senator Baker. But, or you can pass, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass for that, thank you. Um, you know, you've been in office for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Do you favor s term limits for state legislators? Well, the voters always have that in their back pocket. <laughs> and I believe in letting the voters uh, select the folks that they want to represent them. Absolutely. Choice? I would love to see term limits. You know, it, it was meant to be that you go and you contribute your public service and then you go back home. In the days of the gentleman farmer, they'd go off to Washington, they'd do their stint there, then they'd leave. And that way you kept fresh ideas in office all the time. You paved the way for the next generation. So if I'm elected, I will absolutely work to see that we have term limits. I personally am not planning on making it a career. And I want to actually encourage and bring others into the office and say, here, come and learn so that you can one day take over. This is, this is your kuleana too. So it's time. I think for a lot of folks, uh, what happens uh, down in that big building downtown is a mystery. How would you propose making the legislative process a little more transparent so that there can be more community involvement? Well, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of interns, both from uh, UH and other places who come in and they get an opportunity to participate in the legislative process and then they can go back and you know, explain how that works to others. But the legislature has made a lot of improvements. You can uh, participate in the hearings, uh, not all, and we need to expand that, but you can participate uh, in hearings from remote locations, not just coming down to that big square building. Uh, and we also have all of our, our bills and testimony and all of that stuff is online. So we're trying to reach out and make it easier for people from the neighbor islands or from different parts of Oahu, for that matter, to participate because it's very, very important. Sometimes, you know, it's those details and nuances of legislation that are not apparent until you take it to a hearing. So it's very important that people have an opportunity to weigh in. So I would like to see us even have more opportunities for remote uh, connections and allow people for every committee room uh, to, to testify remotely and be engaged in that way. Because I think when people understand the process, and we have lots of supports, our website is really good, we have our public access room that can really help people, but we need everybody's input and we need new and bright ideas that come from the hearing process and having people engaged in the activity. What's and your take? I believe so strongly in transparency that when I'm elected I will actually put webcams in the office so that the public can tune in and see what happens and participate in meetings. So there will be no secret backroom deals in my office. 
We just have about two minutes left, so we'll give you just each a chance to, if you could uh, keep it brief, but we want to get a final thought from you. Uh, it's not easy to be a lawmaker. You're exposing yourself to a lot of criticism. It is a lot of work. Why do you want to keep your job, and, and why do you want to take it? We'll start with you. Uh, I would like to be reelected uh, to the state senate for the district representing South and West Maui because there we've started some things. We're going to be having construction begin tomorrow on the site for the new high school in Kihei, mm -hmm. which has been something that the community has asked for. But I think with the because I have the experience, because I've made the relationships with my colleagues and others, I have an opportunity to actually problem solve and make sure that things that our district needs, whether it's a bypass going north, the high school, other kinds of improvements in our district, looking at new ways to get the entrepreneurial spirit that is in Maui out into the workforce and out into developing jobs and new businesses. It takes somebody with experience and appreciation for the activities around us. And I think I've demonstrated that over the years, the ability not just to talk about things, but to get results. And that's why I'm looking to be reelected because there's more to do on Maui. So I grew up on Maui and I raised my four children there. And it's a big honor for me to have the support and endorsement of Hawaii's doctors, dentists, environmentalists, and teachers, who all people we trust with our very lives. They trust and endorse me over my opponent. And that should give you pause and, and make you ask why. The head of the medical association says my opponent won't even speak to him. So is that the kind of the, the kind of experience that we want, if it's the kind of experience that comes with receiving a bunch of corporate and lobbyist donations, then thank you, but I don't want that experience. I want to bring the experience of transparency and working for the people. That's why I will never take a, a donation from a corporation or the lobbyist, that the people in Maui will know that I always work for them. Senator Baker, I'd love to give you a chance to respond, but we are out of time, so thank you both for being here tonight. Therese Amato and Senator Roz Baker. We are going to do a very quick change. We'll return in a few minutes to hear from the two Democratic primary candidates for Senate District 24. Please enjoy this hiki no story from Kalaheo High School. We'll be right back. Looking at Kailua Town, you wouldn't necessarily know there was a World War II bunker still in use today. But right in our backyards, buried in the hillside, lies Battery 405, fortified with years of intriguing history. So right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the government figured that we needed more protection in Hawaii around the coastline, and they built this bunker and other bunkers as part of the seacoast defense system. This bunker was actually built in 1943, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Bunker 405 was built with two of the guns that came off the ships at Pearl Harbor. When you take a ship gun and put it on land, the gun needs an elaborate cement slab all the way around the gun to disperse the shock wave. Guns fired at sea have enough power to move the entire ship several feet through the water. So you can only imagine the repercussions of firing a gun like that on land. Uh, outside here, the gun had a little building over the top of it, and the entrance to the bunker had a building over the top of it, and both buildings had a Japanese motif to it. And in those days, the idea the United States government had is if the guns were disguised like a Japanese village, that uh, the Japanese wouldn't bomb this facility. The main infrastructure of Bunker 405 was accompanied by another bunker at higher elevation called Fire Control. Up at this bunker, men would be scanning the horizon for threats. And he would have these books back then. Uh, one was all the shapes of the different ships uh, of all the countries in the world, and the other was the shapes and the types of airplanes and aircraft. With the help of these logbooks, someone would be able to identify any plane that might have flown in the sky. Having fulfilled its purpose in World War II, the bunker was decommissioned in 1950. The man that had it from 1950 when it was decommissioned to 2000 grew mushrooms here. His name was Ron Dizeroth, and his hobby was growing mushrooms. He obtained two specific patents for certain types of mushrooms in Hawaii. Gary met Ron at a local restaurant in Kailua and was invited to visit the bunker. And I thought that this would be a really great place to have a data center or a place to back up data. 
Backed by Weller's determination and his dedication to put the bunker to good use, Battery 405 will soon be a fully functioning digital archive system. We started a process of cleaning the bunker out, putting in new electric, computer floor. The first room is complete now and we're starting to market the, uh, the data center. Upon its completion, the bunker will sit on Kalaheo Hillside as a symbol of Kailua's strength and resilience. This has been Ashley Stankovitz from Kalaheo High School for Hikino. Aloha, welcome back for this next half hour. We are featuring two more Democratic primary candidates. They are running in a winner-take-all race for Senate District 24, the seat being vacated by Jill Takuda. This district includes parts of Kaneohe and Kailua and the Marine Base. Current State House Representatives Ken Ito and Jarrett Keoho Kalole are challenging each other for the seat. Please continue to email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook Facebook page. Our volunteers are sticking with us until the end, so please do keep them busy. And now to our guests. Our first guest is State Representative Ken Ito. He has represented Kaneohe in the State House for 12 terms. He was a teacher in the public school system before becoming a representative. Our second guest and candidate for the office is State Representative Jarrett Keoho Kalole, elected to office in 2014. He graduated from the William S. Richardson School of Law with his JD and a certificate in Native Hawaiian law. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here tonight. We want to dive right in with an issue that's uh, very important in your district. It's been a source of controversy for years, and that is the state hospital. In May, the state said it was ready to start construction of a new building for the folks who are the most potentially dangerous patients there, those ordered there by the courts. How satisfied are you that this will prevent killers like Randall Saito from ever escaping again? We'll start with you. Well, there are a number of issues that need to be dealt with at the state hospital that, uh, frankly, we've been ignoring for a long time. You know, uh, year after year, we have these escapes and the community is inflamed. Um, people are angry, we do studies and then we don't really take care of it. So uh, the first thing we need to do and we've, we, we have underway is facilities. We're about to break ground next week on the new high security facility, forensic facility at the state hospital. You know, the state hospital is a 1940s and 50s era a hospital building. We don't have uh, proper security. Uh, it's just not set up for folks who are being committed by the courts. That's the second problem we need to deal with is the fact that the courts, the judiciary, are sending uh, more people into the state hospital, committing them, than we can handle. And so that's a systemic change that needs to happen on the criminal justice side so that we can take some of the folks in our communities who need mental health services and frankly need to be in group home settings off of the streets and back into our, our hospital system where they can get proper care. What's your take on the state hospital and how to make that a better system? Yeah, uh, back in the, when I was in, I attended college, I did my, uh, not student teaching, but I did one of my uh, classes over there in adolescent unit. And when I was there, I could have a first-hand experience watching the hospital operate. And it was very, very outdated. The facilities, uh, because of the climate, everything was rusted. You know, it's, it's located in a real wet area. And after the consent decree, then they started to do some improvement. But one of my big concerns was the community college because like you said, there's all these rapists, all these killers uh, at the hospital. And right across the street, you see the students at Windward Community College. So I was very concerned for the faculty, for the students, and everybody, everybody else on the campus. So I had a bill a few years ago, in fact, more than a few years, I think I put the bill twice, that when they build a new prison, put the forensic unit or the killers, you know, the, and the rapists, all within the prison. So keep it away from Kaneohe and keep it away from the community college where they can pray or escape and pray on the students and teachers. I mean, obviously, and that, the community. That, you know, that, that didn't come to pass. We don't know, you know, there is talk of building a new prison and we're gonna see where that is gonna go. In the meantime, how do we keep that community safe? Well, that's a good question. We put up a fence, they don't go over the fence, they go right through the door. <laughs> So again, what can you say? I think uh, the best thing is put them in a high security area 
get, they get the necessary psychiatric help. We hear from residents throughout our islands about the issue of homelessness, uh, and your district is definitely the, the, the just not immune to this. Um, people living on the sidewalks, people pitching tents where they shouldn't be. What should the legislature specifically, what could you do to address this issue? We'll start with you. Okay, well, in Kaneohe, we have this uh, homeless fair, and uh, I attended two of them. And, uh, well, they had three, so I attended two of them. And the thing about this is, you know, all the agencies, the, the, veteran, the veteran administration was there. We had the health department, the social services people, and a lot of nonprofits. The clergy was there. And we try to help these homeless people uh, get them back into the system, back into society. And I met two veterans. And I mean, they're getting paid and everything. They get disability checks and everything, but they just wanted to stay outside, stay under the bridge. So I try to work with them and uh, bring them back into the society. And um, it's hard, but they took a bath. They had a shower and everything. They had food and um, they had counseling. So slowly, I think we have to get involved, get, in, you know, get these guys uh, adjusted to go back in the community. The representative is talking a lot about services. Do you think services is the answer? So that's part of the answer. A big part of the answer is money. Uh, we made a big investment this year in the legislature. I was proud to have played a part as majority policy leader on making sure that housing and homelessness were major uh, initiatives at the top of the agenda. So providing housing, like I mentioned before, some of these folks with severe mental health uh, uh, conditions, we, we need to provide group home uh, facilities for them because some of these folks just can't make it on their own. They need services. Uh, we also need to have a serious conversation as a community about, about drug abuse. Uh, a huge portion of the chronic homeless population are addicted to drugs. And we just don't have uh, enough bed space available and we don't have a system set up to divert folks who have substance abuse issues, mental health issues, into services. And so that's the other part of it is we need to change these systems that we're frankly just not designed to deal with the homeless population we have today. We've started to do that in Chinatown. Uh, the new chief of police, uh, the HPD chief of police has, has been really supportive of their help initiative, which is basically taking social workers and social service providers out with the beat police, who are the de facto social workers in our communities. In any given community, the police know who all the homeless are, what conditions they have, who's violent. And so when you have the social service providers with them on a call, instead of arresting them and putting them in jail where you get no real outcome and they get released two or three days later, uh, they, they connect with them right there and see if they can accept treatment, if they want treatment. You just get better outcomes when you're offering services to people, you know, right when they need the help, right when the police and the first responders are there. So our ERs, our, our criminal justice system, we just need to provide more access points for folks to get treatment and services. And so we've started to do that uh, in places like town. And it's time to move that out to the windward side, where I think a lot of times we get ignored because we're not always on TV. Our homeless population is not always on TV. You know, uh, folded into the whole homeless issue is the issue of housing, of course, and the issue of illegal vacation rentals, which is very acute in this particular district. Uh, we have someone in from, Danny writing in from Kailua says, what are you going to do to solve the illegal Airbnb issues in Kailua? We'll send it to you first. So, you know, I've, I've actually gone against the, the house position on this issue for the last uh, three years, really. I don't think that the state legislature should be tacitly approving uh, this <clears throat> continued illegal activity, the illegal vacation rentals in our community, unless you can prove that those units are compliant. Now, the mayor just came out with uh, a proposed solution to vacation, the vacation rental issue on Oahu this morning, which my understanding is uh, moves the needle in the right direction. This is something that the counties need to crack down on, frankly, and, and improve their enforcement systems and really have a discussion about whether if we really do have you know, grandmas in their community that want to rent out a room, is there a way to manage that so that you don't have uh, all these residential impacts? Uh, are, are we going to have these units paying higher property taxes? Because I think for sure they, they should. And are we cracking down on the people that are really profiteering? Some studies indicate 70% of illegal vacation rentals are owned by foreign or out-of-state buyers. 
and that 27% of listings are made by individuals who own 20 houses or more. And so these folks are just cheating the system, and I think they should pay. I think we should be cracking down on them. And the state can provide tools to empower the counties to engage in that, but I think we need to allow the counties to work on their enforcement regimes first before we start having discussions about revenue generation. What's your answer to Danny and Kailua? Well, well this one here, we have uh, already the, the mayor, you know, he has this, uh, the, the city council is addressing this issue. I think a couple of days ago they had that bill uh, 33 that dealt with uh, monster homes and multi-generational homes. So I think the tax department should get involved and tax these homes and according to the value, the assessment value that it should be for like a hotel. You know, with a lot of this, we just hear that the, that the issue is enforcement, that they just don't necessarily have the people on staff to, to take care of this, and so that's why we're seeing this proliferation. I mean, is there something specific that the legislature can do to, to address this? Because, you know, we did these quality of life shows, and across all of the islands, this is an issue that people are really angry about. Well, we have that, I just had a call a couple of days ago from Manawili, and this person said he's seen a lot of activity going on, traffic going in and out, these two houses. So I'm investigating right now and find out if it's true. If it's true, well, I'm going to call the city and I'm going to call the tax department and send one investigator down and see what they can do. Josh in Kaneohe is asking about climate change tonight. What are your views on climate change and sea level rise, particularly in Kaneohe? Oh, wow, that's... In Kailua especially, you see a lot of erosion. You see the sand, you know, getting washed out. You see the palm trees just stick it out right, right <coughs> in the, on the beach and uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question you know you, you put a wall you put a wall there something happens um, I was in Micronesia and I saw total devastation of land like 100 yards out you see one palm tree the rest is all water they get those monster tides and uh, I think the city have to somehow come up with a plan that somehow rezone all the uh, shoreline and uh, because I mean you can uh, the hotels too I don't know what's going to happen in the next 30 40 years the, the water might right go right into the hotel and uh, <clears throat> that's something I think we got to do you know get planning get the city uh, get the zoning people the core engineers get one multi task force and come out with some kind of zones so we can at least plan that, you know, these are the areas that we don't want construction, we don't want any kind of development. What can be done in the now to take care of this issue? You know, in this district in particular, you have roadways that are right along the beach, you have houses right along the beach. What's going to happen to those people? Yes, good question. I like this subject because I've been, I've been working on this. And, you know, this housing, homelessness, these are longstanding issues that we've just frankly been ignoring for too long. And you know, this is one where you can't just throw money at the problem, we need to change our systems. So uh, last year we joined the Paris Climate Agreement and one of the functions of the, the bill that implemented that agreement was to uh, uh, initiate the Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Task Force. We've done a lot of work on renewable energy and, and you know, uh, addressing our carbon uh, footprint and, and getting to more renewables, but now it's time to deal with, like you said, what are we going to do uh, during king tides? I've been through neighborhoods in Kailua where the streets are inundated during king tides. So what that climate commission is tasked with doing is figuring out the solution. The, the reality is we don't quite know what to do, and this problem is big, and it's coming soon. So we need some urgency. Uh, we've brought together members of the counties, members of our different agencies who are tasked with dealing with our natural resources, transportation, to figure out where are the areas where we have to make tough decisions now. How can we prioritize what we're going to do in those different areas? You know, up along the coast, in the Kotlau, we have that highway that goes all the way along the water. So are there areas where we can move the road? Are there areas where we can initiate more setbacks? Uh, we've done a number of bills uh, requiring uh, environmental impact statements to take sea level rise into account. So we are uh, working on it. We are starting to take the right steps. We do have to bring the right collections of people together to figure out what the proper solutions are going to be. And the main thing is we need to hurry up. We need to do it now. 
We'd like to get both of your takes on rail. Do you think that the city's rail project should go all the way to UH Manoa? And should the excise tax surcharge be made permanent? We'll start with you. Yeah, I don't think it should be made permanent. I was real clear about this during the special session. I actually thought the way that we managed the overage in the special session was the right way to go. Uh, if you look at the hotels, uh, our tourism industry, not just the hotels, the, the vacation rentals, since I was elected in 2014, uh, the hotels have been functionally sold out, I believe. And we have flat revenue, so we use the, the house proposed using the transient accommodation tax, the hotel tax, to cover the overage. Because I think regular working people, whether you live on the windward side or out on the west side, uh, are just, they've paid too much into that project and we need to get it under control. So to use the hotel tax to just complete the project out gives us a little bit of breathing space. How far into the future are we going to borrow money off of future GET revenues to pay for this project? I think we need to get it finished first and then reassess where we're at from there so that people can have a reasonable discussion about how they want Honolulu to look from an infrastructure standpoint and whether they're willing to pay for it with the GET. Should the excise tax be made permanent? I think uh, the, the thing should expire at the end of the, the rail, the rail project. And I think it should go to the University of Hawaii. I mean, right now, we cannot stop. I mean, we're there, you know. We, I mean, to stop right now would be, gee, a lot of the, already the, the, the plan, already going to Alamoana and everything. People been buying land. They've been buying, buying real estate. They're investing in, in transit-oriented oriented design. So what we're going to do? We're going to stop everything and all these people I think the, the suit after that, you know, we do something like that would be drastic. I think um, I, we, we already halfway or well, over halfway, I think we should complete the whole project. Your district is home to some of the most coveted beaches uh, and it has a high influx of tourists. We're on track this year to have 10 million visitors to our islands. It's statewide, of course, not just to Kailua. But a lot of folks, particularly in Kailua, say, I can't go to the beach anymore or I can't go to my favorite brunch place or the hike that I used to love to go to. It's too crowded. I'm going to skip it. How do we balance, uh, you know, the needs of our economy for tourism with the impact it has to local residents? Larry is writing in, what, do you wa what will you do about the high volume of tourists that ruin the experience for locals? You know, the, Larry's right. In the Windward side, it's the, one of the most beautiful places in, in the whole state. Uh, we get that concern at the Haiku Stairs. We get that concern in Manawili Valley because of the falls. And, Everybody, it's on the internet. It's worldwide. We cannot stop that. We tried stopping that, but we cannot. So more and more people, they come by themselves. You see them, you know, Google the map. They come and walk in buses. I mean, you cannot stop those guys. And, and, and they're right. It's creating a big traffic jam in Kailua. One time I couldn't even go across the street. I mean, uh, uh, the tourists going across the street, I couldn't, with my car, go across because of the volume of tourists. And the bus is plugging up all the, the roads in Lanikai. So I can understand that person's concern and frustration. And we feel the same thing too. In fact, uh, I heard uh, the tourist agency uh, went down there and tried to see what they can do. And they, they, they never do anything. So, I mean, these are the top executives in the tourist industry I went down there to look at it and they couldn't do a thing. So I think for myself, I think we should just ban the tourists from going there. <laughs> or make, make some allocation. I mean, on the, on the other hand, you know, Kailua Town, all those businesses, you have a lot of smoothie places or restaurants or different, yeah. you know, uh, pe people who are doing legitimate businesses who rely on those tourists. So yeah. we can't necessarily right. say tourists don't come to Kailua anymore. Well, the, tourist, the, the tourist guide, the buses come. I mean, I've seen two, three buses. In fact, they have a bus lot in Kailua town. And they all come down and they, they walk in the whole place, which is good for business. I mean, the business people are very happy. But when you go down to the beaches, the recreational areas, it's cr total crowded, I mean, devastating. What more can we do to be, you know, be good stewards of this area? Well, we need to manage the development that's going on in Kailua town right now, just to start off. I've talked to dozens of people in Kailua, 
you know, at their homes who are very concerned about all of the construction that's going on, the redevelopment of uh, Kailua Town. And, you know, at the end of the day, the, the reason for that redevelopment is to attract more people to come in. And so if we're going to continue to allow Kailua to be, you know, that churn to happen in Kailua, we need to make sure that these folks that are coming in and making these investments, uh, you know, to build up business are also paying their fair share and participating in the community planning processes and being, uh, being open to the community in terms of how they do their planning, what businesses, what types of facilities they're bringing in. You know, one of the big ones well, I was just working on last week is the, uh, Alexander and Baldwin is going to put a Wendy's in in a neighborhood right near Kailua High School. And so what I've tried to do is just connect the folks that are responsible for that project with the neighbors over there before you even get the project off the ground. Because too often, the dust screens are up and the cranes are in before anybody even knows what's happening. And you haven't had a reasonable discussion with the community about what the impacts are, how it's going to affect the neighborhoods. We have tourism in Kailua, it's not going away. We just need to do a better job of being proactive in how we manage it with the community's involvement. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people just feel like it's being loved to death. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I grew up in Kailua. I'm jealous that I don't get to eat pancakes at Boots and Kimo's anymore <laughs> None before of us one do, in the afternoon. No. And, you know, I, I grew up right on Wailepo Place by the old Andes Drive-In, and I remember when Kailua was a sleepy little town. And you're right, the world has, has, has found it. And so it, it does require us to be more proactive in how we deal with the impacts that we know are coming, not only with the tourism, uh, and the influx of, of people that come in, but also, like I said, with climate change, how it's impacting our beaches and our, our other natural resources on the windward side. Uh, Kay Faith uh, writes in on Twitter, says, a, a recent article talked about windward condos being purchased by Japanese investors looking to ease their tax burdens. What will you do to stop foreign investors from purchasing houses that could otherwise go to local families? Yeah, so, you know, it's just, I've talked to a lot of people about this. And at the state level, it's just very difficult for us to pass a law to ban uh, foreigners from coming in and spending money. That's just not the way it works in this country. But that doesn't mean we can't try to make sure that we are managing the impacts of people who come in, speculators who are coming in just to profit off of our communities. That's monster homes. That's illegal vacation rentals. These folks Number one, need to be shown that we do enforce our laws and our land use ordinances here. I support Ikaika Anderson's idea to knock a couple of those monster houses down. I told him, I think we should, just to send a message. I was just walking in Kukanono and there's one that just came up, 14 bedrooms and seven bathrooms, and they put it up in four months. Who know, I don't know if they have a building permit or not, they just do it. And so, the, Number one, we have, yes, we have an influx of money just like we did during the Japanese bubble. But number two, the message is out that you can take advantage of the system here. Like I said before, these are, you know, we've been, we haven't been minding the store when it comes to enforcing our laws and managing our, the growth of our communities. And it's time to crack down on these things so that speculators and these folks that come into our communities just to make a buck realize that it's gonna cost them if they break the rules. What's your take on that? What do we well, do to protect agree. local should, families? I agree, we should crack down. But we're not cracking down. We don't have, you know, any agency willing to go down. I call a tax department, nothing happens. Call a DNR, go over there, check it out. They, they get a shortage of workers. The permitting people, they don't have enough. They're all retiring. So here we see a situation at the state level that I think we should do some recruitment and some retention. And we have a computer system. We don't know if it's even working in the tax department. So those are the kind of things that, yeah, we want to do all this, but we don't have the infrastructure to do it. We all talk, we're gonna, we're gonna broke it down, we're gonna do this. Yeah, when you broke it down, what happened? When Sue job, all the lawyers be down there. So then you get legal problems. I mean, people, I mean, it's easy to talk, but when you come down to the bare basic, it's very difficult. You know what, it's about systems change. Okay, a lot of these land use systems, our environmental regulatory systems, the way we deal with our social services and homelessness, these are antiquated uh, state laws that set up uh, these agency systems for the plantation era. And a lot of them haven't changed since we became a state. 
And it's time for them to be, we, we need to restructure the way we, we uh, set up our state government to deal with some of these modern day problems. You know, uh, the reason why some of these agencies can't do their job is because the statutes are limited in their applicability. So none of these uh, uh, TAT, our, our hotel tax statutes, the tax department uh, guidance on, on illegal vacation rentals, they don't exist because our administrative rules and our statutes don't refer to vacation rentals because it's brand new technology. So we do need to empower them and we can do that by changing the laws. We have just two minutes right. left so we want to be yeah, very just brief. Want to follow this. <laughs> you know, Governor Cayetano came up with his very good plan. Reinvent government. Reinvent government now. And he spent his whole tenure doing this. And what? We, we say we got to reinvent again. <laughs> well, we have just, yeah. like I said, we just have, you know, less than two minutes left. So in that time, I would like to ask each of you, what, you know, absentee ballots have come in the mail. People are filling them out as we speak. Why should they check your name in the box? I'll let you go first. Well, I think um, I have the experience. I think I have the, the, the leadership ability to get things done. And I think I have the ex experience of all these years. I'm a type of guy that listens to the people and I'm action oriented. I respond. When I was in the military, I belonged to the unit that responds real quickly. There was a strike command. So that was part of my DNA, the training. And also, I want to also say that all these years I've been very responsive to the Kiki's education. Education is the main thing, I think, for all our problems. Okay, I have to leave it there to give you a chance to respond. Just why should sure. folks check the box? Because I want to reinvent government. I think we should keep reinventing it until it works, because it doesn't work. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. I don't think that we should not act because we're afraid that it's not going to work. I think doing something is better than not doing any, uh, than doing nothing. I think it, the, you know, all of these big problems require urgency, they require new perspectives, we have to try. If we fail, we'll just keep trying until it works. Because I'm worried about, you know, handing over a Hawaii that's worse for my children than it was for me growing up. I'm really concerned about that. That we went, we came out of the plantation era and we might be going back now because of the way things are going. And so let's keep trying until we can get it figured out. Okay, well thank you both for being here tonight. Representative Ken Ito and Representative Jarrett Keoho Kalole. We're going to take another quick change and we'll return in just a few minutes to hear from the three candidates running in the Republican primary for governor. Daryl Huff is taking over as the moderator. Please enjoy this hiki no story from Kauai High School. Stay with us, we'll be right back. The word fact can be defined as a true piece of information. And in our day and age where information and messages are bombarding us from every angle, every second of the day, that's all we really want in life, truth. We are curious beings, we like to know things and we like to get answers, correct answers. As we all know from presentations and essays and reports we've made, it is of utmost importance to be factual and accurate in everything we produce. But isn't it ironic that in a world that is so conscientious about producing substantiated truth, our very selves often lack authenticity and accurate representation. We have fact-checked and weeded through the false information in the world around us, but what about the false information that lies within us? Because when I look around, I see a world that, in the midst of being busy fact-checking data, has fallen into accepting the false lies that society has force-fed to us since the moment we were born. That we have to be perfect and have it all together. That we can't be different. That appearances are everything. A lot of us are living small. We hide our imperfections and we pretend to be like others so that we will be better liked. We say things and do things because that's what everybody else does. Because that's what's expected, what's easy, what's safe. But what they don't tell you about the safe zone is that it's shallow. And in the safe zone, you will never be able to dive into the great depths of meaning and purpose that you were created to explore. Yes, you were created to dive deeper than the shallow depths of conformity, and you were created to be yourself, not her, or him, or them, but you. Because the fact and the truth 
is that you are enough just as you are come broken and bruised come scarred and imperfect you are loved you are important you matter and if you can tap into this truth and let these facts transform you and set you free from the chains of conformity then you can be a production of truth and freedom your life is the greatest masterpiece that you will ever produce more important than any report essay or presentation so hold it to the same standards of accuracy and truth and let it be messy let it be chaotic and imperfect but most of all let it be genuine true to who you are because that is who you were created to be and that is a fact i can guarantee with a hundred percent certainty this is haven looper jasso from Kauai high school for hiki no Aloha, and welcome back to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Now, we've just heard from the Democratic candidates in two Senate races, one on Maui and one on Oahu. Now it's time for a full hour with all three Republican candidates running for governor, John Carroll, Ray LaRue, and Andrea Tupola. We hope you will continue your participation in tonight's show, so keep emailing, calling, or tweeting your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Again, we want to acknowledge our volunteers who have been taking your questions tonight. There you see a live shot of them, still going strong. Now to our guests. John Carroll moved to Hawaii in 1946 with a scholarship to play football for the University of Hawaii under coach Tommy Kaululukukui. He is a Korean War veteran and has been a teacher, a pilot, a farmer, and a state senator. Ray LaRue is a retired Marine, having served 30 years. He also served as the Assistant Superintendent for Facilities for the State Department of Education and is the current President and Chair of the Education Institute of Hawaii. Finally, Andrea Tupola is the current State House Representative for District 32, which stretches from Eva to Maili. She was first elected in 2014 and is currently the House Minority Leader. Let me start with a question I think a lot of people have right, right off the bat. You know, it, it, the state so do dominated by Democrats where the chances of winning a general election against a Democrat in the state right now, most experts would say, is, is a kind of a long shot. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. LaRue, because you might not be as familiar t to our viewers as most people. Why you know, sacrifice your money, your career, your time to run f as a Republican for a governor? Well, I would say I would, haven't sacrificed my career yet. In <laughs> fact, I've had a pretty good one. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's also <clears throat> the belief in the principles of a two-party system. And I honestly believe that uh, to have that natural debate, to have that natural dissenting opinion, such that the voters of Hawaii do have that choice. Um, in a very democratic-run state since statehood, um, it's really been a monopoly, if you would. And even if you look at our congressional de delegation, it's all one party. So I do believe that the voters in Hawaii deserve that different opinion, a new set of ideas, a freshness of voice. And as a geo member of the GOP, I'm also a big comp proponent of small government and how do I keep as much money or much of my paycheck in my pocket as possible. Andrew Topoli, you actually did sacrifice your career to a certain extent, although you could be on to bigger and better things here. Um, personally, how, how do you, you evaluate to make this kind of a sacrifice to run for governor? When I ran in 2014, there was a lot of people that told me that. One, you're running in Waianae. There's no way a Republican's going to get elected. Two, you know, in this state, that's that's a rarity. And three, without any political background, how are you going to raise the money? How are you going to get your name out there? So I had only been living in the community for actually 
three, three and a half years. And so when I ran my first time, all the odds were against me and I was able to unseat the incumbent. That year I unseated the only incumbent and we were able to win with 56% of the vote. So I want to encourage people that it's possible. Anyone who wants to run should get out there and run, especially if your motives are to serve the community. Get out there, show them what you're about, serve them, get to know what their needs are, and never let any stereotype hold you back from trying. John Carroll, I mean, you've run a number of times since uh, you held office. I mean, why do you keep going, and what, what, what's motivating you to, to do this? Well, for one thing, um, my father was a track coach, and he showed me when I was four years old <clears throat> a track team, and he showed this one fellow, and he, was, he said, this guy was a star. He could have won the mile, but in a race that he could have won, at the third lap, he quit. There's nothing worse than a quitter. And it makes you sick to think of people who are quitters. Well, I have lost a lot of races, but I'm not a quitter. There are so many things wrong in this state now that people don't even understand how fundamentally uh, bankrupt we actually are. And that's why I'm here now, because, and I'm glad that we have people of this quality coming uh, <clears throat> into this race. But we, we have a lot to do. We'll, we'll work together when this is over. And um, I'm sure that there's going to be a great, really great success coming out of this race because people have never been as forward coming to me in, in, in my many years involved as they are right now because they know that we have solutions. They know that we know what to do. Okay, so let's start moving on to the bigger issues right right away. Um, I'll start with uh, Andrew Topola here. It seems like in our quality of life shows that we did part of this. The number one thing that kept coming up is the cost of housing, the lack of affordable housing. What, what do you see as, as, a, as a big idea that can start to attack that problem? Well, in the government, the state government has one agency that is actually specifically over housing. It's called Department of Hawaiian Homelands, mm -hmm. and it's tasked to build houses and house Native Hawaiians due to the 1920 Native Hawaiian Homes Act that was implemented by Prince Jonah Kuhio, who was actually a Republican. And I bring that up because last year, the department built zero. And I think that our standard and the bar has been set very, very low. And if it is one of the agencies that it can actually produce housing, and people know that many of the housing um, ethnicity groups is Native Hawaiians, as well as the high incarceration rate, and a lot of it is due to people not being able to be housed. So one, I think that we have to not promise houses if we don't intend to build them. We should fund DHHL and we should get in solutions that can actually work. And we should definitely <coughs> support more local developers who won't take the hit and invest that capital because of the long permitting time. The government should intervene and make sure that permitting time is decreased so that we can build more affordable housing. You're talking about for all ethnicities at that point, the yeah. permitting time. Well, permitting time affects everybody, and a lot of local developers have told me that they will not jump into the game and sacrifice capital if they know they have to wait two, three, five years to get their housing development up and get people in there. Okay, Mr. LaRue, what, what are your thoughts about Yeah, in there? fact, um, just borrowing off the DHHL um, <coughs> issue that, that Andrea just brought up, so we have not awarded any lands, and the people are on the list can be forever, but it's also that that lower tier of folks that have been on that list forever that even if they were given a parcel of land to construct it, they can't get the loan. So it's just really kind of this self-licking ice cream cone in that regard. With regards to the general pop population, when you start talking affordable housing, affordable for who? I mean, you almost have to be in the 70, 80, 90 K income bracket to afford um, really the AMI that, that we're presenting as affordable. Uh, but if you look at the, the state of Hawaii's rental revolving fund, and just by name, revolving fund means the self-replenishing fund, but we're not replenishing it with, with anything except tax dollars. So if we use that fund effectively, for instance, <clears throat> and got people into housing, rental or low-rate low, low rate mortgages, use that rental fund, revolving fund, as it was designed to do, and get them in, in a low-interest loan or no-interest loan, they will pay back. At least that, replenish, that fund is replenishing. Right now we're just giving grants and we're giving developers tax breaks, which then will, will upset the tax base. Somebody's got to make that gap up when you start awarding developers tax base, and I don't know, well, we know who's going to make that up. So, John, I'll give you a shot at this one. Yeah, well, first of all, the Hawaiian Homes has about 24,000 plus potential persons who could uh, be awarded Hawaiian homelands. I found out just by accident Hawaiian Homelands commissioners do not have an inventory of what land is available. And the Hawaiian Homes land provision is primarily put together to, to create agricultural capabilities for Native Hawaiians. And there's 
that leads to the next point in my mind is that this, this economy is basically, as I say, bankrupt right now and we need to have a major component and that's got to be agriculture and the, the state under, under uh, DLNR has a huge amount of, of state lands that are also available for development for agriculture and I intend to get an inventory done both for the state and for OHA and find out why those 24,000 people have not been given the land and make sure that they get it. I'm also going to be looking for an um, amendment to the law to allow them to have that ownership in fee simple absolute rather than a 99 year lease because right now you've got people in Nanakuli and Waimanalo that are below 25 percent percent of blood quantum and they have to get off the property. Let me, let me ask a question to all three of you though. I mean it brought up by, you've all three mentioned Department of Hawaiian Homelands. That's one segment of the population. John, and you saying that you, you think there's a lot of land available. Do, do you folks agree that there's lots of land available that's not being developed, Andrea? Well, I mean, I think back to your inventory question about the general hold. Today, the headlines of the news was saying that the governor's numbers and what's really being produced is not in, is not lining up. And so we need to talk about really w what are we considering as the state's inventory? Because we're actually not a housing agency apart from DHHL. So are we then, one, her helping with permitting, or two, are we giving land? Because actually, if that's the case, then we should talk about public housing. So I guess if I, if I was to address the issue, I would you know think through actually what can we really affect change in the state manages only two properties throughout the state that are actually managed not by the city and county but the state and those are the hcda areas and that's in my area kalailoa is mm -hmm. one and kakaako is one those are the housing developments that we can affect change in because the state's over it but everything else is actually land that any private developer yeah, can buy. It, it, I don't think there's an, a, a large inventory of land that we're just waiting to develop no. to put people in at all. In fact, if you look at Oahu, which is, you know, if you look at the hyper development that's happening on, in, in your district or in the west side of Oahu, there's, there's really not a whole lot of room left. And I would even submit that aside from niche markets, that you're not going to have this large expanse of ag being that second industry either. So. Uh, again, you've got to look at where people are in the income bracket. What can you get them into realistically? Where is the inventory within the urban core? And then certainly spread out through not only Oahu, but the neighbor islands. What can they actually afford? And what can we do as the government to be their advocate? To a couple that? of questions more from viewers. And I do want to keep encouraging our viewers to send us questions. because These are good questions. Caller wants to know if candidates support the present property tax system that taxes long-term residents the same as newcomers. This idea that uh, you should tax the higher end uh, and the outside owners way higher. Uh, do you folks support that idea? I think one of the reasons why that might be problematic is that a lot of some of the outside owners actually own rental properties. So you tax them more, and then does it? end up hitting locals again because these are local renters. So no landowner is going to take a tax hit and then not increase their rental price. So we have to be aware that one, we do have to protect our market. Because when you talk about affordable housing and then it's not here, then you should wonder where it's going. Are we giving it away to foreign investors? If that's the case, then we should make a law for that. But we also have to remember that there is there is no specific one size fits all where all of the, low, the foreign investors are definitely just living on their land. Many of them are renting it out. Well, no, number one is there's an interstate commerce uh, question that's going to arise if you start trying to tax at different levels for different types of ownership. And I think that is a very complex tax issue that I don't know enough about to get into. But well, there's already, I mean, in the city and county, they already <laughs> tax people who aren't yeah, owner-occupants. Exactly. Right. And, and they based on the, the value and so on and so forth. But to start saying, well, this person is from Japan, so we're going to charge them more, and this person is from Korea, so we won't charge them so much as yeah, not yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I would agree. In fact, there has been uh, attempts at that in other states, and the unintended consequences are exactly what Andrea said, and you start having this inequity. And a lot of those other homes, obviously, are <coughs> vacation homes from folks that live on the mainland as well, and if you're going to start taxing them at a different level just because they don't live there for six months, again, you're going to set up, again, those unintended consequences that come in. You know, another great question from a viewer. Um, why are politicians always talking about building more lower income housing instead of focusing on growing more higher income jobs? <laughs> I know you guys like this question. Industries like film and TV, digital uh -huh. music, uh, fit in the talents of our local communities. Jobs that pay so much more. There's also the issue of the living wage. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Ray LaRue, um, 
where, how do we do this? How do we get some higher so that, income jobs? That seems to be the missing equation when everybody starts talking about either affordable housing and then you start looking at the gap between what the livable wage is and then again affording housing. If, if you take housing off the table, for instance, Hawaii is not all that unaffordable. I mean, if you start looking at the, the Costco's of the world, it, it actually is quite manageable for a medium income family to, to provide for their family. You add that housing equation back in, it becomes untenable. So that means we have to change. The only variable that we can change is make more disposable income available to those families that then afford housing. When you start doing that, you're not going to do it with a government uh, paycheck and you're not going to do it in a service industry paycheck. So what is that sister industry that we have to bring in? And if you fast forward five years from now, what does Hawaii look like next? And I ab absolutely believe it's in the tech sector. And when you start looking at things like nanotechnology and biotechnology and the artificial intelligence, the things that are going to absolutely rule the day uh, five, ten years from now, um, those are going to be the industries I think that Hawaii has to invite, incentivize, and, and bring that kind of a workforce Kids in school in the K through 12 system already know this. I mean, if you look, if, if you can write an algorithm for a task right now, that job is gone. So the, what are those jobs that look like five years from now? You know, I'm a huge proponent of vocational training. I, I bring that up because I represent Campbell Industrial, and there's many um, employers that actually have job openings now. And my concern is in the, ed in the field of industry, where are those job openings, and why are they not filled? And a lot of them were telling me is that we don't have as much vocational training as we did before. Could we please start it in the high school level? Could we make sure to increase it at the community college level? Let me, let me uh, interrupt you just for a second. When we talk about vocational education, I think that's a that's a term that when I was a, in school, it meant one thing. And I think that when you're talking about it, it means another. When you talk about vocational education, what kind of vocations are you talking about? So in our, in our area, when I'm talking about this particular company, they basically do shipping. They repair ships. And so it's a very specialty, um, a specialized trade that you can't get. At, at school. So you basically have to build an academy or build some type of shop. You could do it within schools. But when these kids come out of high school, they go to job fairs and think, all right, I'm going to get a job. But a lot of employers are like, okay, what kind of skills do you have? What do you know how to work? You know, have you ever been on a ship? Do you know how to use your hands? Do you know these tools? So I think there's a lot of employers willing to train, but we haven't built those vocational programs. And my, that's my concern is there are high paying jobs out there now that we need to make sure there's a pipeline to train and get our local kids ready to take those jobs. John? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I, I happen to agree partially with what each of them are saying, but the basic fundamental problem in this state is the restrictions that we have on shipping. We've got a, a federal law that says if a ship isn't built, manned, maintained, flagged, and uh, operates in, a, in a America, I mean, in, in America, it cannot travel in interstate commerce. The net effect of that is to cut off the shipping from the Far East and actually around the world, totally violates the Commerce Clause. And Hawaii, along with Alaska and Puerto Rico, is actually bankrupt right now, and people do not even recognize it. That's why I'm talking so much about agriculture and that building up that component of the of the economy because you can talk all day long about building housing or doing this that and the other thing but if you don't have the money coming in from the taxes that are being produced by viable businesses you're going to have a flat economy and that's exactly what we have and i'm going to do everything i can as governor number one to get those shipping restrictions removed and number two to to get all of the potential land that is available and there is plenty available I fly over it in my glider, all, I mean, a glider all the time. So it's. Uh, let, me, let me ask, so, John, I know that this has been a big issue for you for a long time. And, and uh, if the magic wand could be waved, which might, it might take, <laughs> what, what, what would be the outcome, do you think, if you actually got rid of the Jones Act? Would it really make that big of a difference? Or would other people just charge the same amount as they've always been charging? Would it really change as much as you say? Well, number one is that everything we're getting here, if you go to Walmart or, or any of the stores, it's coming in from China, Japan, Korea, the things that you need to farm, pesticides, herbicides, tractors, and so forth, fertilizers. All of that goes an extra 5,000 miles before it gets here. So people cannot farm and make a profit. And that's one of the biggest problems that we have here is because of that cutoff. And, and people have been taking hush money over the last 50 years from Matt's and Alexander Baldwin to keep anybody from talking about this act. And okay. it's an absolute crime to have this thing imposed on us. Okay, I got a lot more questions backing up right here. Um, I don't want to do the sign. We keep waving one yet. <laughs> um, you know, I know, uh, Representative Tapola, you, you've, you've been a big ag ag advocate for agricultural 
development. And we had a question already about what does that really mean? How do, how do we see that? Is it really truly diversifying an economy when the economies of agriculture are so difficult to deal with? This was a, a caller's question. How will you support small and big farmers in Hawaii? So let's talk a little bit about agriculture, self-sufficiency, that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, the federal government has taken some strides um, with this administration to rebuild rural infrastructure. Ranchers, farmers, agriculture enthusiasts had approached the administration saying that the United States has large amounts of ag land that have not been invested in. And that's infrastructure, meaning ditches, irrigation channels, some things that farmers are actually not, don't have the capital to do, neither is it their job to up keep the common areas that the farmers have. And in um, Kealia and Kauai, they brought that up as well, is that some of these irrigation ditches in Kauai have not been cared for for years. The invasive species are taking over farms. And again, for a farmer who doesn't barely have enough to get by, is it their job to control the invasive species? No, we actually have agencies that do that within the Department of Health as well as the Department of Agriculture, but we're not, far, we're not funding it. Yeah, so what's the vision though? What, what, do you, what do you picture being the ideal that you, you want to see happen? Well, I definitely think that with ag land, you have two, right? You have crop land and ag land, which is used for grazing for ranchers. We have to sit with farmers and talk with them through some of the difficulties that they've had because we still have a large amount of ag land. I was just on Maui last night and the farmers over there are still asking, hey, what's A and B doing now that we don't have sugar? I thought we were going to grow hemp. What's going on? Nothing. There's nothing happening there. So we have ag land that's sitting. And so we need to address these issues by approaching these companies saying, hey, what's the holdup? What can we do? How can we help to push this forward? And when you sit with farmers, they'll tell you exactly what the state needs to do. And I, and I think you're talking about our local farmers and the small farmers, both on, uh, mostly on our on neighbor islands. And when I sat down with a lot of those folks uh, on the big island, you know, their biggest barrier to entry is how do I get my product to market? And if you look at the restrictions that the state puts on small farmers, uh, whether it's niche markets, uh, you know, orchids, papaya, et cetera, um, is that whole idea behind food safety certified. And if we're saying, okay, for you to bring your, 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 your produce to market, let's just say, or even, you know, farm to table or even school um, lunch programs, it has to be safe certified. And if the state doesn't have the infrastructure to send inspectors to go ahead and certify that, then then I would say that the government has, has reneged on their responsibility to the farmer. And then we gotta we gotta find a better way to fast track that process for our farmers. I mean if if you look at our, our Department of Education, we serve a hundred thousand meals a day. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's funny you mentioned the Department of Education. I just was reading a report the other day that said when the Department of Education wanted to set up a farm to table farm to school program. Yeah. A lot of the farmers tried and got interested and then when they saw the bureaucracy, they said, forget it. Right. The, the, the bureaucracy is eye-watering and, and not only because we're a 61% Title I state, which means there's a menu pattern that the schools have to follow to get those meals reimbursed, but there are programs, after school programs, uh, snack programs where you can have farmers produce uh, that particular uh, portion of the meal from, from local farmers. But again, it's that food safe certified. Mm -hmm. um, even kids that have uh, farming programs or aquaponic programs in the school can't really eat it. They have to sell it. So finally, for all three of you, do, you know, the Governor Ige talks a lot and many people talk about like doubling food production. When you talk about this agricultural, do you see us actually producing food for ourselves or do you see it as industrial, also a place for industrial agriculture where we're producing food or seed crops, for example, for other people? Well, John. that's exactly what I'm talking about is we need to have major production of agriculture. This, this, this kingdom, if you will, at one time was a major uh, trading place and it was because we could bring things in and we could send things out. They had, I think, 23 treaties with different countries. Up until, uh, well, in about 58 or 59, there was, uh, you know, pineapple and, and sugar dominated. But just to give you an example of what the, the finite side of this that you're talking about, it, you, if you want to raise cattle, you have to fatten them before you, you know, slaughter them, okay? There, there's a, a thing called Beefy 12. It costs $4.50 in Seattle. In Hawaii, at Waimea, it costs $12 a bag. And so what happens is that the cost of, of farming is so outrageous that so many people cannot even think about farming. They're even sending cattle on 747s because of the cost of you know, sending them on Matson. It's just absolutely absurd. How do they fit the seats? So Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. 
They're just kidding. Sorry. Some, some really passengers. Well, they, they, you they, know, they something made interesting. What they want before they let them win. Something interesting when we were on the finance committee is that a lot of the finance committee members were asking the Department of Agriculture, you know, what is this initiative that you guys are going to double food? How much food do we produce? And the Department of Agriculture chair, and he's been great. He actually said, we we don't know. We've never quantified how much food we produce here. So how could you double the goal if you don't know the starting point? And moreover. Department of Agriculture has less than 1% of the state budget. I mean, if we really intend to double food production, then you need to invest in that. It's not going to magically happen by waving a wand. And, and don't forget that, you know, when people use that word sustainability, and, and they use it a lot and sometimes incorrectly in, in my estimation, this state used to be sustainable, but somebody in, in, in government years ago made the decision that we're going to outsource everything, and we used to produce enough food on, on, in this state. We used to have some of the best milk production on the Big Island in, in the entire country. All of that has been pushed off Hawaii, so we used to be sustainable. So to have that idea that, we, well, we have to become more sustainable, we were until there was government decisions to make it not sustainable. Okay, I'm going to move on now. I, I have three questions on this topic, so I better ask this question to honor our viewers. Uh, your position on gun rights and ownership, position of each on the Second Amendment, and the main divisive issue between Republicans and Democrats, where you stand on the Second Amendment gun rights this week. There was a major decision um, from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, Randall, where do you stand? I mean, do you believe it's okay to have people walk around with guns and holsters on their hips? Well, first of all, the Ninth Circuit is court of appeals for them to rule the way that they did on a Hawaii-based case is pretty pretty astounding. First of all, <laughs> if you look at if you look at Hawaii's by law, we are already an open carry state. It's just as we're a non-permissive non-permissive state, so no permits have been. The given. law says you can, but it, the police won't let you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So this ruling really is a Second Amendment ruling, and it's going to clear quite quite a few things up. So, and we're also when you start looking at the laws here. We're a, a may state. In other words, we may allow you to have a permit, not a shall state. In other words, we shall, you mm -hmm. shall have a permit. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think this is going to uh, probably stand the test. And I do believe that if you're a law-abiding citizen, um, it's, it's not the good guys that are out there causing havoc with it. And if you're a gun owner for the, for the sole purpose of protecting your home, protecting your family, then uh, I think that open carry is, is exactly as the Ninth Circuit Court appeal. John said. Well, number one, I believe in the Second Amendment, and I believe I've been a member of, well, I've represented a Hawaii Rifle Association pro bono for like 40 years or so. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a, basically a sacred right that we got at the time of the Revolutionary War. And we never could have had that war if they didn't, if they had any kind of gun control going on. And I, I was so gratified to see the Ninth Circuit, which is usually very left wing, to come out with that, with that, uh, you know, with that ruling that they had. And I believe I've even, I have a, about 44 weapons, by the way, so no, probably not the right guy. questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the point of it is, is if I want to protect myself, if I want to hunt, I have a right to do that. If I do anything wrong with a gun, then lock me up forever. But as far as I'm concerned, gun ownership is is as, as a, much a right as free speech. Even today, in your in your district, there was a tragedy where a, just a, this morning, just this morning, a, 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 a felon had a shotgun, apparently challenged the police and was killed. Three police officers were injured. Um, when you hear talk, I mean, how? First of all, how, I'll give you the opportunity to talk about open carry, but also, are, what are your concerns about what the implications might be for violence in communities? Well, I think that what, you know, what Ray shared is, is true as far as some of the laws, and I think what the court had ruled on was to uphold the laws that are in place right now. So that's what they're, they're telling us. And for people to understand the Second Amendment rights that we have, you need to study it. Here in the state of Hawaii, we have strict gun laws. So in order to even get a permit to acquire, there are many steps you need to go to. You gotta go through a mental health screening, a background check, have a 14-day period of waiting, the permit fee, you gotta take a gun safety course, and then there's also laws about possession. All of the laws stating that you can't be a felon, that you can't have a violent crime, that if you're under 25 years old, you couldn't have gone through the family court. So there's so many things that have been put in place, and that's why gun owners are asking for the state to uphold the laws, because they've gone through a very extensive process to be able to qualify for this. And again, what happened this morning in my district, was he a registered gun-carrying owner? 
No. No. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not talking about those type of individuals. And so I think when people get worried and try to mix the two, you have to educate yourself on what the current laws in Hawaii are because we've actually been one of the safest states with the tightest gun laws. Okay, let me, um, this is a, a big question for three Republicans. What is the opinion of each candidate regarding President Trump? Um, and we'll just go around the table. I mean, if, if given the opportunity to vote for President Trump today, given what, would you vote for him? And uh, yeah, what do you yes, think I, strengths? Yes, I would. I, so, I mean, if you look at the functions of the executive office, and there's three of them, there's, there's uh, head of state, there's chief executive, and there's commander in chief. And no president in modern time has excelled in all three of those, but certainly in some. And if you look at, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a defense-minded guy, having spent 30 years in the Marine Corps, and if you look at uh, what's occurring today, and, and I believe laying at Hickam, is, is the remains of our, of our uh, KIAs from the Korean conflict. And having been stationed in Korea, that, that country is continuously at, at war. I mean, they are on a war footing. To have that relaxed, I mean, this is, this is a very peacemaking event. So when you start looking at the diplomacy uh, by other means, uh, yeah, I, I think this president is actually, you know, doing exactly what he said he would do, and, and I support him in that. Um, a lot of the hyperbole coming from the alt-left and the alt-right that we all see in our social media feeds, you gotta, you gotta divorce yourself from that emotion and just look at the, the basic facts of what is happening to this country. And uh, yeah, right now, I, I, would, I would vote for him again. John? Well, number one is, I, when I first heard Trump was going to run, I couldn't believe it. But then as I heard him during the, um, the debates, I had spent time with Richard Nixon, and he was giving me a big lecture about world peace and, and prosperity and so on and so forth. And the thing that he was saying to me as I heard uh, Trump enunciating what he intended to do, it sounded like I was hearing from Richard Nixon because this was exactly what he said he was going to do and he has done more than I even expected. I've, he threw me off a little bit with the tariffs and then I thought why did he do that and of course now we can see that every, all the turmoil that we've been hearing about from the left is total nonsense and we've got the best economy going in the United States that we've had for years and, and we're finally getting the European countries to pay their share of uh, you know, the United Nations and so forth. I mean, it's a very complicated, but number one, yes, I would vote for him and I'd vote for him again and again. And I'm so happy that we've got somebody that's that astute to be our president. I just have to say, I've heard you say you weren't gonna vote for him, yeah. so you changed that <laughs> position. Well, I never said I wouldn't vote for him. What I said at that point in time was that, was that um, he, um, gave Puerto Rico only oh, a you were concerned about the Jones Act, the Jones issue, Act right? issue. And I have asked him to the magic wand is an executive order eliminating the Jones Act restrictions, at least on Hawaii and probably for the whole United States. So, but I am working on that separately, but that does not mean that I would not vote for him. Okay. Uh, but I just say that that's an issue that I have. So. You're on. Yes, I support the president. I think he's taken some brave steps towards, one, tax reform. I mean, there's been many administrations that were afraid to even touch it. And we needed some of these businesses to bring their business back into the country instead of operating outside. And we need that here in Hawaii as well, is some of those tax breaks and tax relief. Secondly, I think this whole question about border security has been a big issue, and even more so now that we have countries that are very having a lot of different terroristic threats and things that are unsafe. At this point in time, we really need someone that's going to be able to look at it and make sure that we take steps forward towards making sure that other countries that aren't doing background checks are definitely on a different list than those who do have that safe security. You know, let me ask, though, I mean, you guys are out there, you know, campaigning, talking to people. You must hear a lot from a state that went 70 percent for Hillary Clinton. And then um, in recent last few months you had the, the separation of children at the border you had the russian the summit with with putin i mean is it hard to stand behind this president sometimes well i mean it certainly is not always easy but i mean let, let's just take the border for instance i mean if you know as, as a defense guy and a strong borders guy you know there are laws in place that, that you, and you, every president going back three maybe four have said the exact same things that president trump has said it's yeah. just perhaps not in the, in the manner that he has. As a human and as a father, um, I absolutely detest and reject the fact that both sides of the aisle are using children as pawns, and, and I think they should be ashamed in doing that. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, there still are laws, and, and you have to uphold those. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an incendiary question sometimes, but if you, know, you can't waffle on it either. You're, you either are in support or you're not. 
I don't I don't agree with some of his statements and like you know Ray mentioned some of the phrasing or the the, the forming of those statements has been very controversial but as mentioned some of these uh, policies have been in the making for years. I mean, some of these countries were put on that watch list way before he was president. So now that we're enforcing it, what we're asking is to enforce the laws that are there. And that's going to take somebody to say, you know what, this is on the books and we're actually going to enforce it. So uh, I'm going to move on because I, I'm getting so many questions, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 the, uh, I mean, unless you want to answer that question. Well, I was going to say, what if I do mine? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. I said, what if I do mine? But uh, no, no, go ahead, please. So, uh, Rail, uh, is that going to be in the lap of the next governor? You know, you're all hoping to have that job. Um, would you support going, taking Rail down King Street with the goal of reaching UH before going to Ala Moana? And the question that's been very common uh, that people have asked is, do you want to go to UH at all? Because some, some would say stop it at Middle Street, some would say stop at Alamoana. How far should rail go, and how would you pay for it if you started running out of money? Andrea, to both. Well, I definitely am not for putting any more taxpayer dollars towards the rail. I think we've seen enough extensions that people are losing hope in a project that seems very, uh, I think, mismanaged is, is the easiest word I can look for. The, the fact of the matter is that we can hypothetically say where we want it to go but what type of funding do we have and how much is that funding going to allow us to go I've been on the phone with the Federal Transportation Administration with Elaine Chow's office and I've asked what is it looking like for you guys to re release the rest of the federal money and they said we still have not seen a plan from the city and county of Honolulu that looks viable for us and if that funding doesn't come in then we can't hypothetically determine that we would take it to Kalihi or to Manoa because you have to be realistic with the funds you have if you don't have a solid funding source then you are not being realistic with the end point of that project let me ask those a little more specifically is you know, the legislature did fa pass a funding package in this last legislature, I don't recall whether you voted for it or not. I did not. Okay. So or would you say that you would literally stop the project or were you just unhappy with the funding? Uh, so the four things that I propose amendments to the bill as to what, how I thought it could get better is one, of course, a forensic audit. Two, is that we should definitely create public-private partnerships now, seeing as though it could be unsustainable in a very, you know, in the very near future. Three, is that we should make sure that there's a cap on public dollars spent so that we know that it's not going to go to infinity and we're giving a blank check. And four, is that we should cut the neighbor islands out of it because the stress that it put on a lot of the other legislators as well as the funding system, people were not happy about not having their voices being the heard. hotel tax from those islands being yes in. yes uh, and, but in terms of if if this fund if this funding is enough you you wouldn't cut it cut it short no okay. I mean I think we just need to take it to where the funding is now but that's all up in the air because the FTA has not made a ruling on right. whether they'll disclose the money John, okay. your <clears throat> number one is <clears throat> if I'm governor the first thing I'm going to do is file in federal court to get a forensic audit with audit being done by by accountants from the federal government, number one. Number two, I'm going to stop all construction for, the, for 90 days, and I've asked Governor Ige to do this already. First of all, there, if you read the recent minutes of the Hart Board, they called for an executive session. There was con conversation about what about this, what about this overrun, what about so on. There was so much question, and then they called for an executive session, which was closed. And in that, they, when they had to, to state why, they said we have to discuss liability and immunities. Now, when the Hart Board members are worried about going to jail or being liable for costs, that is a, a huge red flag telling me we've got to get on top of that like now. And I think Governor Ige should be stopping what he's doing right now, finding out what money has come in, where it's gone, who's gotten it, what we've gotten for it, and if people got to go to jail, then so be it. We start out with about a one and a half billion dollar project. Now we're looking at 12 billion and the operating costs of that are just absurd at this point. Let me ask, though, again, to be specific, as I was with uh, Andrew Topola, do you support the project as an idea, even if not the way it's been managed? Um, what, what she said is actually partially what I believe as well. I think with private, if you give par private partnerships, you look at maglev, you look at the cost of tearing it down as opposed to, to putting in maglev uh, um, Routes, be, the, routes the, between you know where where they stop and and so forth, uh, and out to to the um, to the university and to the air, uh, to the uh, to Waikiki and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. If it's doable, but to me the whole thing is affordability. And with this economy the way it is, we can hardly afford to put up you know low income housing for people that are living on the streets, much less. 
paying for this kind of a boondoggle. So. Really? Yeah, and, and if, if you look at the project, and, and we're in the middle or the beginning, I would, would say, of a, what I would call a mobility revolution, how we're going to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the technology that's being offered, what that does is that it makes any rigid rail transportation system obsolete within about 30 years. Mm -hmm. If you look at all of the metro stations or light rail stations within the country itself right now, their ridership is down other than the, the light rail system in Seattle. Everyone else has a decrease in riderless and it's really ride hailing that is winning the day. And if you start fast forwarding that um, with driverless technology, it, it's going to be the way that we're gonna go. So why are we using uh, yesterday's technology to solve tomorrow's problem. That's what this rail is. If you start looking at the affordability of it, um, <clears throat> we haven't even started the construction yet that's going to go into town, which will be by far the most difficult and challenging part of this system. Um, knocking it down doesn't make any sense at all because then we'd, we'd be, you know, nobody would get into that, that private-public partnership. And, and for private-public partnership to work, you've got to have benefit on both sides. And right now, I don't see the benefit for any private investor to get on board with any sort of public works project that, that as, as large as this and as uh, fiscally irresponsible as this. So let me, again, to sum up, though, would you just it's, it's going to reach Middle Street. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, not so there. Or, yeah. Then, I, I, I'm a proponent. There thing. is, yeah. if you look at some of the analysis and a lot of the transportation um, uh, leading voices in this state and even the country, there is some merit to stopping at Middle Street. I mean, if you've been to Washington, D.C. and you come out of the metro and you need to get to Georgetown, the metro doesn't go to Georgetown. It doesn't go to the State Department. They have this circulator that you hop on and it gets you to point A to point B. You could make the, the Middle Street transportation hub work getting people into town into the UH complex on the circulator type of arrangement uh, but to bring that rigid rail downtown uh, there's a beautiful rendering of, of uh, the guideway going right down Alamoana Boulevard graffiti and all and and I'm not sure that's what we want. Yeah, Daryl let me I want to add very some, briefly because I got to yeah, move on. Briefly is if we stopped at the stadium where it already is and forget about going beyond the stadium what, what Ray is talking about makes a lot of good sense because we could have the bus the bus is going from there to any place that you wanted to go. And uh, the, only, the only really reasonable solution that I see right now is that, to stop at the stadium, forget any further construction. You want a last word on this? Um, fixed point transportation is a thing of the past. If we don't have uh, streamlines going out from the rail line, really it's a very limited population that's going to be able to use it. Many cities who have rail have said that ridership number. I mean, building it is one thing, but maintaining it, it's a whole other There's conversation. Another story, right. Okay, so sea level rise, how will we handle that? Um, is there any doubt in this group that sea levels are going to be rising? And is there any question about what we do about it, Ray? Not, not on my, uh, so when you start looking at the erosion pieces, uh, mm -hmm. you know, keeping our beaches pristine, and if you look at the expense that we incur by, and, and you've, we've all seen this, we'll go out into the, you know, about 100 yards off, off, off the beach, we'll dredge up all the sand, we'll pile it back on, and then we'll do, repeat that every five or seven years. If you look at the fourth generation technology to stop that, it's called geotextile tubing. And it is uh, used in other nations quite successfully. It's, it's about a quarter of the cost and lasts almost three times, four times as long as the simple dredging. The beauty of it, though, is it actually promotes new coral uh, reef growth and protects the environment in that regard. So. Um, and it really it does nothing for the surface, so you know that, that would be the question that people. But is that is that is that essentially a way to harden the shoreline? Is that the way you? It, it, it would harden it, yeah. And in, in, in the, the, te the way the technology works is you stack these tubes, and then of course there's that that kinetic wave energy. Isn't that, that a little bit like fighting Mother Nature? Like it, it isn't, but, but if your beaches are disappearing, you've got to do something other than spending a lot of money of dredging and then bringing the sand back. And I think it's a it's a fourth generation solution that works, and it's it's uh, affordable. Yes, this morning we spent time with the Hawaii Conservation Conference and there was a lot of conversation about sea level rise, climate change, what are we going to do about it. In 2009 there was a climate change task force that was mandated by the legislature as many task force and uh, boards one, it didn't ever convene. Two, it didn't get funded. In 2011, it just stopped. Do we need more groups like this that actually address things like erosion? Absolutely. I mean, I think that DLNR is definitely tapped out. And of course, on the north shore of our island, that whole road falling into the ocean, it's not a specialty of Department of Transportation to know how to fix it. So we have to talk about it because as we know, the 
island is eroding and are we just band-aiding it or are we actually coming up with real solutions? Do you feel like we need to move back from the shoreline or as uh, Ray LaRue suggested, we, we harden the shoreline? I think that there are Native Hawaiian indigenous management practices that we've gone away from. Today that's the conversation we had is that prior to um, the overthrow, there is definitely an amount of different Native Hawaiian practices that actually preserve some of this. I think we need to go back and start to have some co-management models with experts from the area that already know how we should be better stewards of these lands and actually address these things naturally and more cost effectively. John Carroll? Well, my, what I want to see is the most recent scientific uh, conclusions that have come to and, and see how valid those conclusions are because this whole the whole thing is, in my mind, my dad was a scientist and there's a lot of questions that I have and I wouldn't even, I don't even want to answer that question to tell you the truth. So you don't, you're not certain that sea levels are going to rise? I, I'm certain that there's going to be changes, but you can see the tremendous impact on our environment just with the volcano here. And uh, what, when you're talking about sea level rise, look at what's happened to the shoreline of the Big Island. There's so many things going on in this world that, that we need really solid scientific proof as to what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. And I want to see that before I would be making any uh, educated comments about it. Okay, I'm going to move on to another issue here. Hawaiian sovereignty, a lot of, it's sort of the discussions kind of died down for a little while, but uh, you know, and I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Andrew Tapola. What do you see the proper uh, structure of the Hawaiian nation vis-a-vis -vis the United States? Well, I think there's two conversations, right? Sovereignty, federal recognition, which one do we need? Which way is the path forward? Exactly. I agree with um, certain principles in sovereignty, which is empowerment and ownership. And I think that that is actually a concept that even as Republicans we believe in, which is empowering the people, less government, more empowering of the community members, having them make decisions because politicians, they go and come. Community members stay for decades, for centuries. So we really need to think about how some of these concepts that really that's what sovereignty is about, right, is taking back your right to be a people and to assert yourself. Well, we can do that now. And I think that a lot of times, and even in my own community, I've reminded people that this is our land, this is our community, so we can stand up and we can be a part of it. We can create change. We can make initiatives that we don't have to ask the government for permission. We can do cleanups. We can do anything we want. But a lot of times, and especially now that we've had this real distant relationship with the government where, oh, they're supposed to do this for us. Oh, city and county never did this. Granted, our government is definitely inefficient in some areas. We still have a role to play. We all have a responsibility in within our own communities to be good community members and be stewards of the land. And I think those are the principles that I resonate with in regards to sovereignty. Okay, Ray, do you uh, yeah, feel it, like a uh, Hawaiian sovereign entity is a good idea? And there are those two schools of thought. I, I think the sovereignty movement is smaller versus the federal recognition. And if you start looking at federal recognition, and, and you start looking at you know, what does that really mean if we and if they that federal rec happens or that fed rec um, you know that introduces a lot of unintended consequences as well if you if you allow that gambling piece in other words because they would have the same allowances that say uh, the federal recognition of Indian tribes in the mainland would have and if you look at you know the elitists at the top of that group and the folks at the bottom there is a huge disparity and I think the unintended consequences of that federal wreck have to really be explored before we start doing something like that and um, but yeah I mean y you have to absolutely wrap your arms around the cultural sensitivities of of, of course sovereignty and then the federal wreck piece as well so John well number one and federal recognition is totally out of the question they've already gone through all of the different requirements for federal recognition, tribal recognition, and they and, and Hawaiian Hawaii does not meet any of those. So federal recognition for Native Hawaiians is just nonsense to even talk about it. As far as I'm concerned, the international law is that there's been a military occupation in Hawaii since 1893. There's not been one day when there were no Marines, Navy, whatever here, and so the the the, the kingdom legally exists at this time. So there is sovereignty. The kingdom is here. What are we going to do about it? Now, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that makes any sense is to have a plebiscite and have everybody who's legitimately able to vote as a member of the kingdom. And this would be not, not you and I from Marin County, but anybody that's born here, they're, they're, anybody who came here, whether they're Chinese, Japanese, whatever, in the 1800s, their descendants all would have a right to vote on the sovereignty issue. I personally feel that that plebiscite, if it's held, would, would end up 
calling for, to remain as a state of the United States. But it's a right that they have. It's something that could go before the United Nations. I met with uh, a lot of the Hawaiian activists, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's up to the people who are citizens of the kingdom to make that decision to move forward. And I will work with that group if they decide they want to have a, a plebiscite on that issue if I I'm need to governor. put something in the form of a yes or no question on this. Okay, the current um, entitlement programs, OHA, Hawaiian Homelands, um, do you believe that they should remain, Ray? Yes, but there's a whole lot of caveats to that. I mean, if you look at the mismanagement <laughs> <means> no. of OHA. <laughs> yes, but no. Um, you know, if you look at the candidates, for instance, that are running for OHA and OHA at large, they're doing so when you talk to them because they actually believe, and they've, they've stated as much, of the dysfunction and the, and the, the, the abuse at OHA right now. And if you look at uh, how they're, they're supposed to be, t you know, minding the welfare and the betterment of the Hawaiian, native Hawaiian population, and they're not. DHHL, they have the land piece, so where those two intersect is not a, a synergistic effort as well. So, yes, I do believe that they need to be uh, in existence to answer your question, but not in the current state that they're currently okay. performing their, their duties. Um, as far as I'm concerned, OHA has failed, the Hawaiian Homes Commission has failed, and as governor, what I intend to do is to see uh, what can be done to get them, get them straightened out and, and to continue, uh, and that is to be able to function. So my answer would be yes, they must re remain in place, but subject to radical change, uh, emasculation, if you will. Andrew, yes, yes, okay. I believe the entities need to Okay, that was easier. <laughs> um, okay, so now uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about the social issues, uh, abortion, um, gay rights, uh, and so on. So let's start with, with abortion. Your guys' positions, beginning with John Carroll on uh, pro-choice. Okay, um, well, number one, I was in the legislature when we adopted Roe versus Wade, and I really saw abortion as a legal way to avoid child support. Fast forward about 25 years, uh, I had a child born, my fourth wife, and uh, she was born three months premature. She weighed one pound and five ounces. I was reading Dr. Seuss to her for about a month. The mom had had a brain hemorrhage and had been ill. Eight doctors called us into a, a meeting. Then six doctors said, this kid is gonna be crazy. She's gonna be a cripple. She'll be you know, a burden on society. The best thing to do is to get rid of her. One doctor said, I don't know. One doctor said, there's a 10% chance. Now, I probably shouldn't say this, but I was a devout pagan at that particular time in my life. And, uh, but she asked me, John, what should we do? And I said, are you kidding me? She said, I said, no. I said, well, do you think I'm gonna kill my own kid? And that's when it really dawned on me what abortion is all about. So I've gone being from totally pro-choice to, to violently uh, pro-life. And uh, I do not believe there should even be an exception for rape or incest. The kid did not do anything. There's no reason to kill a child simply because of uh, external circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I personally do uh, practice pro-life belief and I, I think as the state we do have pro-choice laws. And so as a lawmaker, as the governor, I will uphold the laws. And of course that conversation happens at the legislature. And I was actually one of the legislators that proposed a bill that was po probably a nice in-between, which I um, introduced a born alive infant bill. And so it's not all the way pro-life, not all the way pro-choice, but definitely it does preserve the life of a child that's born, you know, that doesn't actually get aborted. And so I think that the conversation lies within the legislature if that, if they want to change the law, if it's the people's choice, but personally, I am pro-life. Yeah, I mean, I, I was raised Roman Catholic, and because of that, I have my own belief system as well. But um, you know, the the laws that are laws laws of the land today uh, sit, and and I would agree with Andrea on this that you know that that is not for somebody like me to impart my viewpoints because of my faith in the way that I was raised and, and have that smack up against uh, the laws that sit today. I think we only have time for one more question. We've got about three minutes. Um, and so uh, the, the tourism industry is just hyperinflated right now. We have the vacation rentals in all of our neighborhoods. I, I'd like each of you to give me a, a, a sense of whether we have too many tourists, not enough tourists, and what should we do about it? And I realize that's a big question, I'll start with you, uh, John Carroll. Well, first of all, one of my main things that I want to do as governor is to, to set up a tour to Hawaii to compete with the Tour de France. And it would be a bike race or bike event 
starting in Kona in February on the beach, going up Mauna Kea where they'll have snow, down to Hilo the next day, up to Mauna Loa around South Point and so forth. It'll be about a five day race. It would bring in the best bikers from around the world. It's gonna be highly competitive, highly uh, you know, required. I don't think I could do it actually, but it's, uh, it's something that I think would bring a huge amount of tourist in industry into the state not costing us anything and get Hawaiian Airlines and a couple other Japan okay. Airlines. Ray yeah, and, and I the, said... The question was, too many yeah. tourists or not enough tourists? Yes or no, no. It's, uh, <laughs> well, I, I do believe, I, I think we're about right. I mean, I, I, I sat on the uh, you know, Oahu Visitors Bureau board for the calendar year of 2017. I saw their marketing approaches, how HTA looks at each market and how, whether it's expanding or not. And our main you know, visitor pie, if you will, is still mainland USA and then you know, Japan, Korea, China, New Zealand, Australia. But what we're doing is we're pushing the tourist base out into the other islands and out into our neighborhoods as well. I mean, when I was living in Kailua, you never had buses of tourists coming yeah. to Kailua, and that, that's a problem to me. I need to move. Go ahead. Uh, I think we definitely need to worry about what impact tourism has played in our, our islands, because we talk about, should we have more tourists or not? Let's talk about, are we taking care of all the impacts of tourism? And that is what the TAT was supposed to take care of. So the TAT tax was supposed to address all of those impacts, and actually right now, it's still at the same point, which 103 million is capped. The four counties split it and they share it, and that's been the conversation that's really hurt hurt the, the counties is that they want to have more of the TT share seeing as though that a lot of the impacts from tourism affect county operations. So in 2015 they convened a work a working group to determine what is the the even or equitable split of the TUT. Should it be that the counties only get 103? Because last year we made 560 million in TAT income. So the actual outcome of the work the study group was half. So it was should be half for the county and half for the state. Okay, well, that was a great job, everybody. Thank you. It was a quick, pretty fast hour. <laughs> Mahalo to all of you viewers for joining us tonight, and we thank our guests, John Carroll, Andrea Topola, and Ray LaRue. Next week on Insights, we'll be back to an hour-long show, but it will be packed with six Democratic candidates running for the first congressional district seat. Former Congressman Ed Case, City Council Chair Ernie Martin, Lieutenant Governor Doug Chin, State, Donna, State Senator Donna Kim, and State Representatives Beth Fukumoto and Kaniela Ng. Join us. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.